Welcome to the Top Texas Lawyers Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the law firm of Abercrombie & Sanchez, PLLC. You can find us on the internet at astxlegal.com or by calling 1-888-981-7509. Your hosts are Brian Abercrombie and Samuel Sanchez. Brian has been practicing law for 18 years and is board certified by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization in the area of family law. Sam has been practicing for 13 years, is licensed in both Texas and Florida, and is a certified mediator. This podcast is for informational purposes only, and all views are the opinion of the hosts. It is not designed to provide legal advice for your particular legal matter, and it should not replace the advice of competent counsel. Welcome, and we hope you enjoy the Top Texas Lawyers Podcast. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Top Texas Lawyers Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Abercrombie, and with me, as always, is the Garth Algar to my Wayne Campbell, uh, <laughs> Sam Sanchez. How you doing, buddy? Doing well, doing well. Rock on. <laughs> or the Doc Holiday to my Wyatt Earp. Anyway, Absolutely. Maybe with Definitely. our topic today, that's more, uh, more appropriate, don't you think? I'm your Huckleberry. <laughs> All right, so... Um, we are going to talk today a little bit about firearms. We're going to talk about uh, some changes that might be coming down the pike. Um, we're going to be talking about the new uh, proposed gun law uh, in the that's before your Congress this uh, this term, and um, we'll um, we'll go and do a deep dive into that. But first, Sam, you got any uh, any juicy tidbits for us? Anything anything going? Well, I thought since we were going to do something, you know, gun related and, you know, trying to mesh up, you know, uh, guns and celebrities isn't always the easiest thing. But I did come across a celebrity cheat sheet about celebrities who own firearms. And I thought okay. it would be kind of interesting to talk to Lay you. Lay it on me. Let's hear it. All right. So, you know, obviously one of the big ones that, you know, isn't really a surprise to me, but I guess was a surprise to many people is Samuel L. Jackson. Um, sure. I can see that. Pulp yeah. Fiction, I mean, I can, you know. Yeah, he says he grew up in, you know, south in the south. And so, you know, that's where guns were everywhere. And he said no one ever shot anybody, but everybody had one. I can, can, can relate to that for sure. Absolutely. Uh, next up, uh, you know, Johnny Depp. This is somebody who I thought would be walking around with like a pirate sword more than a, a, a weapon. But you know, I, thought hey, they didn't allow, I thought he lived in France and they didn't allow guns in France. I don't know. <laughs> but you know how it goes, you know, money status you can get them it's it's only for yes. hunting purposes brian it's only for hunting purposes. sure 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 that's what they say uh I, okay so not to just you know stick to the male categories but I, J jennifer lawrence is somebody who said um that she's you know a fan um she said you know her i think what let me get the quote exactly she said her ideal future involves having a nice house with a big dog and a shotgun that was to rolling stone so yeah they gotta like her i can see her she's from kentucky maybe right if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Think, she's from yeah, the mid. I think she's from the mid southwest. I don't know what Kentucky's considered, but I but it's sort of rural. Yeah. It's rural. They got some rural there. There's some hunting dogs there. That's for sure. Uh, throw another that. one out there for you that I thought was kind of a surprise. Whoopi Whoopi Goldberg. Yep. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, so obviously this is somebody who's very outspoken. She's you know the one of the hosts right. in the View. Um, well, I don't think she's you know any anyone about uh, a, a membership in the NRA. She's definitely somebody about like yeah, she owns a gun, and you know I think a lot of celebrities. The things that people don't understand is you know you know they're in a position where they feel I think constantly threatened, you know, constantly sure. potentially in harm's way. Um, another example that Ice T, my man Ice T. Now somebody who grew up in South Central, give me a break. Like he's not going to freaking have you know. <laughs> With some weapons, but he's definitely somebody who's on the pro gun contingent. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, you talk about celebrities and when you talk about, you know, potentially, you know, being on the threat, you know, um, I remember this interview I read a long time ago with, uh, with Michael Jackson, obviously it was before he passed away and, and everything like that. And he was talking about in the eighties, he would come home to his big palatial estate there in the, in California. And then like be people, you know, people sneaking in sitting by his pool waiting for him. Yeah, I mean, you crazy. just, you know, I mean, if you're in the, in the spotlight and you're, if you're one of these, you know, really popular celebrities, I could see where you might get your fair share of stalkers or, you know, various people that might have some sort of, uh, you know, agenda or mental illness or whatever the case may be where they're, um, you know, they're wanting to, wanting to get a piece of the action, right? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. I, I, you know, I really feel for these uh, celebrities a lot of times, you know, everybody kind of looks at, you know, why it would be so great to be a celebrity, but you, you give up so much for that life. Uh, and in privacy, you know, a sense of 
I think um, being safe and anonymous uh, in any right. type of situation is gone. So I can definitely see where that would be one. So I got two two good ones for you. And obviously, this is one of my favorite movies all time. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Angelina Jolie. Yes. Big time gun owner. She says, you know, not only is she a gun owner, she had some custom set made by Jesse James, which is pretty cool. She's also one of my favorites. I mean, the movie is one of my favorites of all time. So yeah, I get hilarious. that. Yeah, her ex, Brad Pitt, big man. He's a big hunt. He's a big uh, gun owner too. So you know, uh, they were. She has a pair of custom, custom made Cisco 911s. So I mean, how cool is that? That was made for her by Jesse James. That's not too. That not too bad. She awesome. said she can use them both, right? So um, just wow. Yeah. Cool. So I mean, yeah, just you know, a couple of names out there. Obviously, some big superhero thing people. You know, like in the past, I know you're 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 sure to recognize this name, Bruce Willis, right? I mean, you sure. may remember him from this really small franchise called Die Hard. Uh-huh. Um, and Die surprising. Harder and Die Hardest. No, no, just kidding. <laughs> and to wrap die up harder. the list, I thought I thought you'd like this one. Uh, pop little pop star is a uh, Madonna. Madonna is definitely somebody out there who she's rolling maybe. with action, huh? Yeah, she's, she's rolling. Back. She's rolling. I guess she's she's what we she has. She has what we call a heater. She she carries. She definitely has a heater and knows how to use it. So there you wow. go. A, not a comprehensive list, but you know some interesting people that you know. I don't know that people would automatically say, "Oh yeah," but they do. Uh, but they do. So there you go. Okay, so Sam, I don't think it's any secret. I'm pro gun. I think you're pro gun as well. Um, but. Um, you own a gun. I own a gun. Uh, we, uh, you know, you have several. I have several. We live in Texas. I'm one of the best, uh, one of the best states in my opinion. But I'm a little biased. Uh, but obviously, one of the, you know, the largest states with respect to gun ownership, you know, in the United States. And and it's not just for, you know, it's not just for hunting turkeys and deer and uh, and and birds. It's uh, you know, it's it's for home defense as well. I mean, people, people do own guns here and, you know, you grew up around them. I grew up around them. Heck, my dad was in law enforcement. So we always had guns around the house. So let's talk about this gun law. Um, Obviously new administration came into, came into office in January the 20th. And there's been a number of different things that have happened, but one of the things that's kind of jumping out is the, this is probably one of the most, and you know, there's there's pundits on both sides that said that that have opinions as to whether or not this has a snowball's chance in hell of actually passing the Senate. But it is kind of a good a good discussion point of what the uh, kind of what the tenor is out there. So there's obviously a very very big pro gun lobby, and there's a very very big anti gun lobby as well nowadays. So let's let me just hit you the highlights of of this bill, and then we can kind of kind of dive into it. But basically, uh, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee out of uh, Houston, Texas. Down, down um, in your neck of the woods. Yes, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> or fortunately, depending on who you're, uh, what your side of the political spectrum is. But in any event, um, she proposed a gun control bill um, that would create a national firearm registry, set the minimum gun ownership age at 21, and require licensing and psychological evaluations before you can own a gun. Now, I don't know what it says about people who currently own guns, but that's that's a pretty strong, you know, we'll get into the rest of that, but let's touch on that one for a second. That's pretty, uh, that's a pretty strong reach, I feel like, in my opinion. Well, anytime you're going to create a whole nother agency or, you know, use, expand the extension of an agency, the ATF, obviously already has a pretty wide purview um, for the federal government. And, you know, we look at imposing something like that on all the states, you know, you know, some states may be in favor of this. I would tell you that Texas is probably not going to be one of them. Um, (laughs) But, you know, you're talking about some very substantial invasions in in my opinion on your, your, your personal liberties, Um, you know, and and a sense of privacy because, you know, and we'll get to all of this as we go through, but even just the registration, okay. And psychological evaluation, first of all, I'm sure that's a psychological evaluation done by a doctor who's pre-approved, you know, by the ATF, Um, you know, and so, you know, what does that look like? So we're going to have shrinks now, um, deciding who can own guns and who can't own guns? Are they, is that the job of a psychologist or a psychiatrist to, to determine yeah, that, gun ownership? Well, you and I both know as litigators who have been on both sides of using and defending against psychological reports, you know, those aren't always telltale as far as, you know, making sure that somebody is, um, you know, sane or has the ability or the comprehension ability to be able to own a firearm Heck. or, you know, drive a car. 
I mean, because I would tell you a lot more people get killed in, in all these states in vehicles than they do using firearms. Well, good. Um, but you don't have to take point. a psychological evaluation to do that. I had one of the foremost psychological experts tell me one time, well, do if you really think that, you know, any expert can get a, an accurate psychological read on somebody with a three hour interview. And that's pretty comprehensive sometimes in some of these litigation cases, a psychological evaluation where they're interviewing the subject for three hours is pretty fairly comprehensive. Um, if you think you can get a read on every facet of that person's personality, you're sorely mistaken. So, and that was a, that was an expert telling me that. Agreed. Exactly. And, you know, in that, so, you know, you're saying one minute and, and, you know, six hours later, you're not, you know, I mean, can you pass a psyche eval and then get your weapon and then six hours later be in a traffic accident and just, you know, lose your shit. You know, that's entirely sure. possible and plausible, possible, you know, plausible. And so I don't know that that really is going to be anything, hopefully, that anyone would sign up for or believe that it's, you know, going to be a valid, you know, gatekeeper, you know, for who should own a firearm. But it's oh, definitely get- something that they're proposing. Let's get into this a little bit more because it gets better, Sam. Um, okay, so you it would it would be a crime to um, possess a firearm or or ammunition, not just not just a firearm, but ammunition as well, without the new license or to sell it privately. You ever been to a gun show, Sam? I've been to a gun show. Uh-huh. You've been to a gun show, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, or to sell sell a gun to someone who doesn't have the license. So you would have to go get the license, or you couldn't buy anything, or you couldn't sell a gun. So, um, you know, highly regulated gun industry is what it looks like. I mean, and, and ammunition, the same as the, so if you wanted to go buy some shotgun shells to go bird hunting, you have to have a license to go do that, you know, well, theoretically. I mean- yeah, and not only that, but I mean, I think what they're trying to do on this type of legislation, it this is, you know, they're they're probably, I would say, ninety percent. You know, that's obviously a guess on my part, but let's just say seventy percent. Seventy percent of the gun owners out there are law-abiding citizens, right? Especially the people who have registered firearms, who are LTCs, licensed to carry. You know, these are individuals who are trying to adhere to the law. So the only type of restrictions that they're trying to impose are on people who are already law-abiding citizens, right? So when you talk about creating all these additional hurdles for individuals to get into these, you know, these are designed for, you know, the, 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 you know, shooters who like at worth the Las Vegas shooting or a Sandy Hook, you know, wherever you you're looking at these, these are exceptions to the rule. And so, but you want to make the rule apply to everybody. And you're missing out on the people who really you're trying to control or restrict. This isn't going to stop someone who is crazy or who's a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a criminal who really wants to, you know, utilize firearms in a way that's going to, you know, do mass shooting or harm individuals. You know, they're going to get it through illegal means. The legal means you're just really making it harder for the individual that's, you know, law abiding in each state. And not only that, but when you talk about these types of restrictions, and like you said, that are so comprehensive and so really, um, you know, suffocating for the individual gun owner, you, what you do is you, you further create a wedge between the federal government and people who have been raised, you know, around firearms, who want to have them, who feel that it's a part of their, you know, constitutional rights and that they believe that they need it to kind of maintain their level of protection for themselves and their family. And, you know, that's the worst place the government really wants to be in, in my opinion. But, you know, this is definitely, you know, something she feels is going to be helpful. I don't know. I I think it's just really going to have the opposite effect. I've never I I heard her give a talk about about AR-15s and that they're 50 caliber and things like that. And it it strikes me as a person. She strikes me as a person that doesn't know a lot about guns, trying to, you know, legislate, (laughs) legislate guns and gun ownership which is a, a huge problem. You have a lot of people that don't necessarily know anything about guns writing these laws and putting these laws in place. And look, nobody wants a school shooting. Those, those things are horrible. But if you look at the places that have some of the most restrictive gun laws in the, in the country, they don't, it doesn't cut down on gun crime. I mean, take, take the city of Chicago, for example. Um, they have some of the strictest gun laws in the United States and there's gun, there's shootings every weekend. And, Absolutely. you know, the most murders, what in, in the U.S., they were like the murder capital of the world there for a while. 
I mean, but the bigger part of it for me, Brian, is obviously, you know, one of the very first provisions that we talk about, that we're going to kind of talk about, I want to bring up is this registration requirement. Okay. One of the things that there, it's this really nice small clause at the end of a sentence, which I love that they always do these in laws like this, but it says, you know, that they want to know the make model serial number. Okay. They already get that when you purchase it, the identity of the owner of the firearm, if you're going to buy it legitimately, they're going to get that anyways, the date, well, it's on the federal application that you have to fill out now. Right. But the next piece is in where the firearm is or will be stored. Right. So are you saying that, you know, the federal government is now going to have a map that says, hey, you know what, Sam has firearms in his bedroom in a biometric safe that's underneath his you know, bed. He also has a gun closet where the majority of the arrest weapons. Are. I mean, it's just it, it's insane that the federal it's government insane wants overreach. to have. Yes. I mean, it, 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 extreme overreach. Something look, you that, and I, you know, hopefully they never would get. You and I have both litigated cases where there have been potential, you know, gun issues where you have people that are gun owners and they're maybe off the deep end or things like that. I've had, I had to store 150 guns in my office one time because that's what the judge ordered until we could get a case resolved because there was sure. a, you know, a, an agreed protective order involved. And, you know, there's, there's, there's ways to, if, there, if, if you believe someone is truly a risk, then there are ways, you know, through the state courts and through, you know, to, to prevent, you know, possession of firearms. I mean, I think um, this, oh, and let's, let's get into this more because then you're talking about also gun owners uh, would have to pay insurance for, for oh, the cool. guns. That's where I was going next. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I bet that, I bet that policy is going to be super cheap. <laughs> Right. And then you can't have, like I said, you can't own anything larger, anything 50 caliber or greater. So, you know, that's completely illegal. Um, you know, what about if you already own a gun? Um, it gives the U.S. Attorney General and the, and the ATF um, jurisdictions over licensing and uh, over the guns, over your guns and licensing. I, it just seems to me that this is like a kind of a Trojan horse for a further gun of, okay, well, we know your gun's in the living room closet. So go to the living room closet, turn over your gun and bring it up to the porch and we're taking it. You know, this is a mandatory buyback. I've heard, you know, rumors of the, uh, not rumors, but talk of a mandatory gun buyback and, and things like that, that they're, that's further on down the road. But I think this is a, is a Trojan horse towards that, in my opinion. Um, Okay, there's also a gun owners will have to complete a government training course, have a clean record and register the firearms. We, you know, we, we talked about that. Registry would be available to law enforcement from the local, federal, and well as US, you know, local, federal, and US military would also have all of the information on your gun ownership. Now, I, I personally, I don't have a, you know, I don't have any, any concern about that, but um, there are people that do. I mean, there are people that, you know, don't trust the government. There are people that, you know, live out in the, out in the wild and, um, you know, like their privacy and don't, aren't comfortable with that. So, well, Brian, I mean, you know, it, yeah. And not only that, but look, I would love to tell you that the government always has the best of intentions, right? That they always are going to do things and take the high road. But you and I both know that that's not always the case. And there are plenty of times that, the federal government overreaches using your private information. And so this type of thing really kind of plays to, you know, a faction of the, of the, of our society that's already out there saying that there, there's already too much of that. There's already too much of the federal government monitoring you, your communications, you know, what you do or don't do your preferences and utilizing them against you, whether it's doing health insurance laws, whatever, this is just another way for them to collect additional information on individuals and potentially be able to use that against you in the future. We don't know. And, and so while I agree with you, I don't think that there's necessarily going to be anything that they're going to find out about you or an eye that, you know, like, we, it's not that we don't want to turn it over because there's something to hide. It's just, why should we have to turn it over? I mean, th th give me right. the legitimate basis for what that information garners you. And the only thing that, you know, as, you know, as, as a child of someone who was in law enforcement for his entire life too, I would tell you that they would, you know, police officers, you know, states, federal, you know, whatever level, they all want more information just so that they can kind of look at it and say, I know who I'm dealing with. 
well, sure. you know, the, you know, I, I understand that perspective. You know, I want officers to be safe. I want, you know, them to have as much information as is necessary to, you know, enforce the laws and, and keep society as, as, a, as a whole safe. But I mean, I would just, just, I would, I would think that the people that are going to use, you know, firearms in the commission of a crime or, you know, something like that would be less likely to follow any of these, any of these requirements. Yeah. I don't think they're going to take any tests and I sure as <laughs> hell don't think they're going to tell you course? where to keep Are they going to go to take yeah. the training course? I mean, yeah, what does the training no. course entail? Oh, and I mean, we've had this, this is an ongoing discussion, you know, I mean, obviously we've had this discussion, you and I about, you know, laws are passed for the people who follow them, not for the people who don't. And so, you know, this type of, you know, law, in my opinion, is, you know, directed at individuals really at, who are, are on the fence about maybe having firearms, right? Because if you looked at right. it and you said, I have to take a psychological evaluation, even if you're totally sane, that's a pain in the ass. I have to keep an insurance policy. And so, you know, these are prohibitive measures, I think, to kind of dissuade the, you know, the people who are on the fence about potential gun ownership. And then on the flip side, I can't go deer hunting this year because I didn't pass my psychological evaluation, right? Is that uh, well, what we're, we're not, talking about? Not, not only that, brother, but like, hey, you know, times are tough. Times are tough. And so what about the individual out there who inherited a weapon, but, you know, doesn't make oh, a lot of money, is living, is living, you know, hand to mouth. And so you're looking at, well, hey, I can either have an insurance policy to so that I can own a weapon to protect my family, or I can just give it up because I don't want to have I don't have that extra money to spend on a monthly basis on an insurance policy because who knows how much those are. And so yeah, I'm not gonna do it. You know, these so are you, things Do you have any um do you have any antique guns, Sam? Oh, absolutely. I love that. Yeah, I saw that. Or something there. that might be displayed on a you know, displayed in your home. Yeah. That would I, require I have, a that was, let's say you never shot that gun. Let's say you had a flintlock, you know, from the Revolutionary yeah. War, yeah. Um, or a musket. I'm sorry, from the you know from from the, the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, whatever. And um, you'd have to have a license to uh, to to have your flintlock. <laughs> yeah, I got my grandfather's, you know, black powder. I've got, you know, my great grandfather's, you know, old, old Winchester. So, you I mean, these are things that, you know, they're not going to be fired, but they are on display just for the history of, you know, what went on within the family right. and what they mean to us. And, and so, you know, you're going to have to have a license for that as well. <laughs> you know, we have a gun, want to know we have a gun in the family that we have a gun in the family that's not an automatic weapon. It went to World War One with my great grandfather. And, you know, yeah, you're going to have to have a license for that. Um, oh, the big, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Not only that, Brian, but a big part of this too is let's say you know because obviously you know they want to talk about you know what's a you know military style weapon. Well, obviously our AR-15s are going to be military style weapons, right? These are things that. You know, but it's such a broad, it's a broad brush you're painting with. They're oh, talking about semi-automatic rifles, handguns, as well as some shotguns. Any anything that can get under a, an umbrella of military style weapons. What does that even oh, mean? Yeah. I mean, well, military weapons are typically weapons you can't get. You can't, you and the normal person can't get. So, right. I mean, you know, the, but so let's say it's got a folding stock or a pistol grip. Well, they, 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 they consider that a military style. If it's semi-automatic, but it's a semi-automatic version of a fully automatic weapon. So, you know, that contain that, that in and of itself, that particular term, that encompasses a whole lot of firearms that are out there that are people in possession of, you know, the ability to accept a detachable magazine. I mean, you know, a, a fixed magazine capacity in excess of five rounds. Well, that's a mini 14. I mean, this is a, a weapon that I hunted with as a kid since I was 12. Do you know what I mean? So that's not a, that, you know, while and it, could nobody in the military is going to want to use an AR-15 <laughs> in the military. They, they got access to way better stuff than that. Right. So, you know, I mean, these are the kinds of things that it makes it extremely difficult for somebody, one, in my opinion, to be compliant. Um, but two, it's really designed not to allow people to have them, but to dissuade them from having them. You know, and, and, and then potentially if you're like, well, hey, you know what, I'm going to be non-compliant. It sure gives you, you know, the ability to be in a whole lot of trouble, you know, based on not having your insurance policy because you couldn't pay it that month. You know, things went bad, but you're not going to give up your guns because these were inherited. So, they were gifts. I mean, it just. Let's, it, it, so let's talk about just who's going to be completely just axed from the list with, right away without without hearing, without, you know, review or without anything. Anyone who has ever been hospitalized due to a mental illness, drug or alcohol abuse, homicidal or suicidal thoughts, 
or brain or a brain disease would not would not be eligible to obtain any kind of firearms license. Period. Yeah. You had so a drinking problem well. in your twenties. You're done. Yeah, you can't get well. You can't get treatment. I mean, again, clearly they don't believe in that. Um, you know, I mean, that is a huge paintbrush. That is a huge swath of a paintbrush across. Oh, it society. gets better, Sam. It gets better. The psychological evaluation process would also take into account the psychological condition of other members in the licensee's household, current and former spouses, relatives, and associates. Now, you and I both know. So your ex wife is crazy and you can't get right. one, huh? <laughs> right. They're going to go talk to your ex wife and then they're going to decide whether you, uh, whether you need to have a firearm because you oh, had wow. maybe a bad marriage. How many times, or, Brian, do we have somebody, a client come in and say, the first thing they want to say is what? I've diagnosed my my other person, my other spouse, uh, my, the other side. Yeah, bipolar, emotionally Narcissist. unstable, <laughs> psychopath, sociopath. <laughs> sociopath. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Well, the and biggest then, piece of uh, it is But penalties. also, let's say, let's say I, I, in, my, in my household, all of my guns are completely locked up. I'm the only one who has access to it. I guess my wife has access to but... I have trigger locks. I have, you know, every safety precaution that I think is, is appropriate. But this uh, means that if let's say you have somebody that they deem potentially a risk in your living in your household, even though they may not even have access to the guns, you could be prevented from having this, this license. Yeah. The mother-in-law comes over. You're in trouble, Brian. Just <laughs> no kidding. I'm in trouble anyway, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, well, I mean, know, the, these um, are some big penalties for violating those laws. I mean, if it, if, if it were to make it, I mean, she's not making it a, Hey, a slap on the wrist. I mean, you're talking about some substantial penalties. Right. Um, yeah, I think it's knowingly violating the sections is like seventy-five to one hundred fifty thousand dollars. You could be in prison not less than fifteen to twenty-five years. I mean, you know, these are federal charges, and you know, the the challenge is I don't know if it, you know most people know out there, but most federal charges, you know, they have like a ninety-eight percent conviction rate, and the yeah. reason being is because you know it's once you've violated those, the conviction is pretty hard pressed to get around. So I mean, let's give you yeah, a, I, give you an example. There were twenty three million firearms sold in the United States last year, and that's just last year. So, you know, you're talking about a tax on every one of those guns. You're talking about you know potentially having to get a license for every one of those guns. Number one, I, I think the government's going to be so inundated with license, you know, licensing uh, requirements that I don't know that they could, you could ever get a license approved. I mean, that may be, you know, maybe you have to wait or the strategy, seven years to get your strategy. license approved. Part of maybe that's part of the strategy. I mean, you know, obviously whenever the uh, these bills go through the, the legislation process, obviously things get taken out, things get amendments and things get added, taken out, you know, before it ever goes to the, to the Senate. But I think, you know, the, I guess the question will be, you know, whatever this bill looks like when it passes the House, because I assume it's probably going to pass the House, um, and then it goes over to the Senate, you know, what does the Senate do with it? Um, you know, you have some very fairly pro-gun, um, I don't, I don't want to say pro-gun, but pro, pro-Second Amendment senators out there, even some Democrats that, that are particularly pro-Second Amendment. So do I think this is going to pass? I mean, hopefully not, but I think it's a really good illustration of kind of where the the two sides of this argument are right now and it's uh it's definitely the most most radical gun law i think i've ever seen yeah it's definitely taken it in a direction that um you know obviously should raise a lot of challenge one would hope um but it is a big part of you know that it made it to the floor in this form you know that it was really proposed from someone who's from texas um even though she's you know from a, a fairly large democrat democrat um, constituency in Houston, I would, or the Houston area, I would tell you, like, you're, you're still Texas, the heart of Texas, right? I mean, and so, you know, this is a conversation that's not going away. The, you know, every time the legislation comes up, it comes up in a different fashion, and it seems to be moving further and further along this trajectory, which is, you know, it's scary. You know, it's really something that I think individuals really need to pay attention to. And we talked about it before, right? Politics, the, you know, where you, where politics, where the rubber meets the road in politics is really going to be locally. And so sure. paying attention to the, the vote that you cast for the individuals that are proposing laws are going to come up. But not only that, but then once they do come up, really paying attention to what it is that they're proposing happen. Um, so, you know, I think this is going to get obviously a lot of that's conversation, a good, but that's a good point you make because there was a bill even just before the Texas legislature this year where a, a, a representative was looking at um, 
trying to repeal the castle doctrine in Texas, which is a big, a big law in Texas. That's a, something that we Texans <laughs> are very, very, uh, very, very sensitive to. And um, that was the, you can't shoot somebody that breaks into your home. I mean, I think that's, yeah. you know, that, that retreat. Yeah, basically. So what yeah. do you, you know, what do you do in that situation? I mean, I think um, it's just, it's a, it's, there's not a lot of middle ground on, on, on some of these things where there, I think there could be um, because nobody wants a school shooting. Nobody wants, you know, those, those things to happen. Those are obviously horrible tragedies and, you know, they don't need to happen, but you know, at the same time, I think there's some sensible middle ground in here, but nobody seems to be concerned about middle ground anymore. It's, it's all one way or the other, right? Yeah, I mean, middle ground, I don't even know what that means anymore. But I, I agree with you. I, I mean, do we think exist. a three year old should be able to own a Uzi? No, it's not. No, you know? but I do feel like that, you know, what if it's your home, and you want your family to be safe, because you travel, they should be able to, you know, own and possess a firearm. Um, you know, these are things that, you know, help offer families and individuals a sense of security and peace of mind. Uh, and I think that, you know, challenging that, you know, informationally and process wise, um, by passing these types of laws is an extreme challenge to that fundamental liberty that we've enjoyed for a long period, a long time. Uh, but and it's my definitely personal, my personal opinion on it, this, this, the Second Amendment you have you know, that the, the purpose behind the second amendment is not to not so you can have a deer rifle. It's, it's to have, be able to own a firearms to protect yourself and, you know, protect from, you know, theoretically a tyrannical government. That's why they, that, that's why the founders thought it was important. The framers thought it was important to have this law or have this yeah. amendment in the constitution to protect, protect yourself, depending on, you know, depending on what the particular threats of the day are. And if you want to talk about restrictive ownership, I mean, like nothing is more restricted currently other than maybe like, you know, certain, you know, certain types of maybe like plutonium or some, you know, <laughs> as far as, you know, owning something as guns, the laws on the books across the states, across this country are voluminous, voluminous. And it hasn't stopped gun violence in this country. It's not, you know, I, I, I get it. I understand that part of the conversation and I want to fix, you know, I want it to be where, you know, we don't have this except to defend yourself in the worst situation at the last minute and to keep your family safe. But unfortunately that's happening more and more everywhere, everywhere. It's right. not just at home. It's in your car. It's at the mall. You know, people, you know, they, there's all kinds of news reports about, you know, people getting assaulted and attacked. Hell it's in our freaking capital. So do you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it doesn't matter where you are. These are things that are really, that we've utilized and have been implemented, you know, since the inception of our constitution to afford individuals the right to have the ability to protect themselves and maintain that against all comers. And I think that's important. I think it's something that we need to continue to protect. And if we're going to try to limit it, it needs to be really well thought out. And that conversation between both sides need to be very open and honest about what it's really designed to try to do. Because this I mean, and all me, things, and, and all things being fair, I mean, I think there are some, some middle ground that that people can agree to in here where you know you don't want to give give you know allow the mentally ill to have you know access to firearms and things like that i mean that's obviously that's something that's a no brainer right and you just have to you have to you have to balance you know the need for public safety with respect to the need for you know having a a constitutional right well a, a good example would be if you want to make sure nobody dies in a traffic accident well have no cars then no one can die right. in a traffic. Well, that's not, that's not society. That's not, that's not how society functions. And, you know, people feel the same way about guns. You know, you can, you can come up with sensible, sensible alternatives to this where you, you know, can keep the, the guns out of the hands of the most risky, but at the same time, you know, this seems to be like a, a dramatic government overreach to private citizens who are, like you said, law abiding citizens. Yeah, I mean, it's I don't I, I get it's not really targeted to the individuals. I think it's really trying to restrict. But you know, this is something that we're going to watch closely. I'm sure everybody else that's listening out there will probably hopefully do a quick Google search and do their own reading and research and form their. I own don't opinion. take our word for it. Go uh, go form yeah. your own opinion. Do the research yourself and see. Yeah. You know, like I said, do look at the the crime statistics. Look at the gun ownership statistics. Look at this law. Look at this law and see if it's see if it makes sense to you and see if it's reasonable to you. I mean, and it's like I tell my kids all the time, right? You know, as a closing thought for me, I would tell you, you know, when 
the government tries to limit an individual liberty, everybody should be involved in that conversation. And it's something that should be very well thought out and, and discussed from all perspectives, because the more that you give up an individual liberty, the less free you are. You know, irrespective of what it is, you know, whether it's going to be on this tact or any tact, if it's a personal liberty, you should really think about how best to protect it and protect it as much as you possibly can. And that really involves being active, being educated and having a voice and let people know. So now get involved, whether you're whatever side of the ledger you come down on this thing, get informed. And, you know, like you said, if you're going to tr- if your rights are going to start being restricted, know the ins and outs of 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 the, of the arguments you know, if you want to lend your two cents into it, learn the arguments, learn your, learn your position on it. You know, I would suggest going out and, and, you know, going to a shooting range and shooting some of these guns and seeing, you know, what you think. I mean, sometimes people, people are scared of the thing they don't know. You know, I mean, my, you know, I have a very, very close friend who grew up around guns. Guns were a normal part of their life. Guns were out on the kitchen table when they came home because they were a very big farming and hunting family. And he's not concerned about guns in the least because he grew up around them. Nobody ever shot anybody. Nobody ever, you know, did anything like that. Everything was very sensible. Um, but they knew guns were dangerous. They know they're, you know, they know they're deadly and they know they practice proper gun safety. But at the same time, you know, they're not, not afraid of them. Maybe, you, you know, sometimes education is, is important. So get to know these issues and, um, and then you can, then you can form a reasonable and informed opinion, whether for it or against it. So yeah. If you guys want to talk to us about anything, um, we can be reached at uh, my phone number is 281-374-4741. I'm at Abercrombie at astxlegal.com. Our uh, website is www.astxlegal.com. We are on Instagram and Facebook at astxlegal. Um, Sam, how did they get a hold of you? Well, I'm up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. You can uh, come by the office. We're in uh, the North Fort Worth area. You can call me directly at 817-914-5470, or you can hit me via email at ssanchez at astxlegal.com. And we also have offices in uh, Round Rock. We have offices in El Paso, and we uh, obviously are in Dallas-Fort Worth, Houston in the Woodlands, and we can cover pretty much anywhere in Texas. So we are you happy to find me in Miami every once in a while. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> that's so true. That's that Miami. is yeah. true. Um, but uh, we're happy to talk to you. We, um, I appreciate the time, Sam. We're going to be coming back uh, next week with another exciting topic. I think we're going to k- k- jump back into to family law and do some a do series of uh, a couple of different things we got, um, got coming around the corner. But uh, thanks for the time today, buddy, and we will talk soon. Yes, sir. Say when. <laughs> Say when. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the Top Texas Lawyers podcast. If you'd like a consultation with either Brian or Sam, please call 1-888-981-7509 or visit us on the web at astxlegal.com. Once again, that's astxlegal.com. Thank you very much.